Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and other musicians, uncover their life stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, then stick around. You're in the right place. For information on advertising, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. And if you're enjoying the show and you'd like to support it, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, I've got such a cool guest as a human being. And uh, Amun Maru is just like a tremendous guitar player from Norway. Uh, first of all, let me just spell his name because it's not something that you're going to recognize natively here in the States. It's Amund, A-M-U-N-D, Marud, M-A-A-R-U-D. Um, he's, we'll get into it, but he's one of the greatest blues players I've ever had the pleasure of listening to, man. I mean, he's just so soulful. Uh, I, I want to thank our mutual friend, Jace Everett, the monster, the man, the myth, the legend. Thanks, Jace, for hooking us up. Uh, let me give you a background about Amund, and then we'll get into it. He's been a leading star. Like, this guy's a celebrity in Norway, like, you know, you got to roll out the red carpet. So this is good stuff. Uh, Amun's been a leading star of the Norwegian blues and rock scene for over two decades. At 18, he was a well-known guitar prodigy. And since then, he's still remains one of the most active musicians around in Norway. Uh, he has a ton of different projects he's played in. Like they're all excellent for one reason or the other. Uh, one of his projects is a sixties psych rock band called the grand. And if you have some time, go over to, uh, what's, uh, what, pa pa what's the show rock palace, right? Yeah. 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 yeah go to rock palace and look up the grand. Holy shit. This is like, you know, sort of like cream but it's not cream it's just but in that vein of music he's playing an sg it sounds amazing um he's got a number of various solo bands including the duo maroods his jazz rock trio called amgala temple and go on um wherever you watch videos or i think is where's the video is it everywhere is it just on apple or i think they're everywhere okay look yeah Look up Amgala, A-M-G-A-L-A, -A -A, Temple. It is like such a cool video of these guys playing. He does this, uh, it's like an eight-minute psychedelic blues jazz thing. It is so freaking awesome. And then the video itself is really cool. It's got like drones outside. Anyway, but it's great. So check that out, Amgala Temple. Uh, he has a one-man show where he plays acoustic, and he also has uh, uh, joins forces with an Americana band called Lucky Lips. Also, a, a project called the Bu the Buick, where uh, he sits and plays with some noted poets in uh, only in Norway. Is it Scandinavia? All the Scandinavian countries? No, it's only in Norway. Norwegian poets, and uh, he's toured Russia, Europe, excuse me, the States. Uh, he also toured Euro uh, England, where he headlined the Royal Albert Hall, and he was the music director of the Norwegian Norwegian Blues Adventure. He's played South Korea, Cambodia, and Japan. Um, and he turned down Kim Jong Il because he wanted him to come to North Korea, but he said no. <laughs> uh, he received a Norwegian Grammy in 2011. He got the Edvard Grieg Composer Award in 2016. And also in 2016, there's a famous blues festival in Norway, the Notodden Blues Festival. He got the Blues Award. And in 2018, he got his own star at the Blues Walk of Fame in Notodden alongside the likes of Ry Cooter, B.B. King, and Bonnie Raitt. He's currently right now in his studio uh, called Snacksville Recordings, and he's working on his seventh solo LP. Man, I've been so excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. He's just a great guy, too. We've talked a bit before this. <laughs> You, thank you, Craig. I, I really appreciated you, you know, just asking me to come on the show. It, it means a lot to me. Thanks. Oh, and thank you to Jace for hooking us up. Yeah, man, for sure. No, I'm happy you're here. Are you kidding me? Uh, all right, so let's get into it. You started playing guitar at the ripe old age of two. <laughs> but this is why you can't play like you. It's like playing golf like Tiger Woods. You can't rewind time. I mean, you had to start like, you know, you start at two, you start playing golf at five. That's what happens. So you start at two by age seven when most people are playing with uh, uh, like Legos or Pokemons. Uh, you're out gigging regularly with your brother on drums and your dad on bass. And then you played on national TV for the first time at age 12 
and you released your first album when you were 18. So I have a few questions on all of this. Um, from reading your background, it almost sounds like music was sort of like the family business. So I wanted to know, how did you get started so early and how did you get to tour and play out so much at a young age? And then you can comment on the family business thing as well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, music uh, has been the, the, the hobby and passion of my father uh, all his life. But he never, uh, he was never a professional musician, but he was playing a lot. He was the leader of a big band. He played trombone and he played guitar. And then he's, uh, he's, he's like a Neil Young nut. You know, cause I've, I've been trying to pitch other artists to him, like it's in, in the same vein. And it's, uh -huh. I don't know. Just, just Neil. Only <laughs> <laughs> needs, you know. And um, so, by uh, 1986, 1987, I think he stopped playing with his bands because, so you know, he was he became a father. I was born in '81. My brother was born in '83. 80, uh, uh, but there was all these guitars around. You know, there was guitars everywhere, acoustics. Uh, let me do, let me show you the first one. Oh yeah, man! Look at this. This is home to me. You know, this is. Uh, what? He thought it was a 1979 Strat, and he thought he bought it in 1977. Go figure. <laughs> well, they had that Norwegian time machine that they don't have here. <laughs> that's it's so. Actually, it's actually from 1980. That's that's an original eighty strat. That's really not. And your that was your dad's guitar. And that, was that your first guitar then? Yeah, the first one I tried. You know, just the smell of it, the sound of it. It was just it was magic. Hmm. You know. And uh, and then when I on my seventh birth, birthday, he took me uh, to buy a cheap Les Paul copy because I thought that um, I can't remember which was the which or the other but you know i thought that the stratocaster was like a solo guitar and the les paul was like a rhythm guitar okay you know the things you believe when you're a kid yeah right? hey you got a guitar out of it that doesn't <laughs> that's good <laughs> cheap uh cheap uh, les paul copy uh i think it set us back like 30 30 dollars and then uh, this guy gave me a speaker for, for a handshake uh, but then later we we, we bought um uh, you know the super champ the um, yeah the fender the fender super champ yeah i still have that too and it sounds great god that's got to sound amazing sounds amazing yeah you had so many cool amps in the, the amgala temple video i was yeah. like holy shit and you know what too you just gave me an idea for everybody out there that's actually a good idea when you want to buy a guitar and you don't want your wife to give you a hard time you say I'm buying this because it's a great rhythm guitar. Yeah. <laughs> this is like perfect because that's probably not one that anybody's used. So now, okay. So thanks to Amundi, you have another excuse to get a guitar. You have one more comes to the door. You got, and you, you got a new rhythm guitar there. How about it, a bridge? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the thing about this guitar is th this is actually the guitar that taught me that you only need uh, one strat. And there's many strats to go. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful guitar, man. It's a beautiful guitar. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of heavy, you know, and, and they stopped doing the contours uh, around 70, 73, 74, I think. Because you see the, the cut isn't as deep yeah. as they had in the, you know, in the 60s. Yes. Yeah. And a dear friend of mine actually... The first one I ever heard play electric guitar, play a blues solo over a 12 bar blues. Uh, his name is Doug Finhoven. He's a really good guitar player. And he's a luthier too. So he just fixed this guitar. I got it back last week. Oh, that's so cool. What was wrong with it? I was, he needed a new nut. Uh, the frets were all worn down. Mm -hmm. He fixed the electronics. He remembered that he went to Oslo with me in 92 to buy this pickguard plate. And, uh, and and a new five way switch in ninety two. Yeah, it's been a part of the journey of this guitar. That's so cool, yeah. man. Yeah. So it's a really resonant, cool guitar, and and the neck just fits in directly into my hand, like feels like home. Yeah. All strats fit really good. They're so easy to play, and I don't have big hands at all, but they're so easy to play. They are, and just uh, it's. Uh, it's, it's a love story, you know? That's cool, I, man. 
I remember a guitar player had um had a picture of a fifty four or fifty five two tone sunburst strat. You know, I took it out, had it on my wall, I was looking at it, you know, and it's you know, uh <laughs> it's it's magical. And it yeah. still is still magical. Yeah. You know? Uh how did how did this whole thing with like how did you get on TV and how did at such a young age like how did you get noticed I guess is my question. Well, I think um, I, I think my father has been pushing more for us brothers than we kind of got at the time. Hmm. He he saw how much we got out of it, and uh, I think he saw the uh, our motiv- motivation and and uh, you know our this drive to become better musicians and and he i think he just wanted to see if if we had something you know yeah so we um the first time uh at age 12 on national tv that was like that was a part of a talent okay where we could uh, you had like a local version then you came to the uh, more um the county version, I guess. And then you have like a, for the whole country, like a finale. Sure. And uh, this is in, Nor- in Norwegian. I think, did I send you the video? No. Oh, I have to send you the video. Because of the was, finals? Yeah, it's, it's there. And and they're interviewing us and I'm 12. My brother is 10. And my father is my age now. And that's wild. That's really and wild. It's just dawned on me. You know, he's 40. And the interviewer is asking him, you know, doesn't don't you feel that it's weird to be so old amongst all these? Wow, <laughs> because he was playing with you guys, yeah. He's playing bass with us for uh, close to eleven years. That's so. That's that must have been a great experience, though, for all of you. That was fantastic. And and the thing is, he um, it was um, uh, Seaman on on the keyboard or piano. He's a, he's a fantastic boogie boogie piano player. Uh, he went off to New Zealand and lived there for uh, for eight years and toured with one of the guys from Counting Crows. Uh, and his father and my father, our father, is the, you know, their, their buddies. So they were driving the cars, you know, and, and we played really early at night because they don't, didn't want us to, to see all the drunk people and, you know, all that. Sure. So we played from maybe six to seven. Sure. And we wanted to stay, stick around and hear the band, you know, the grown-ups play. Yeah. You know, we could, no, no. Straight into the car and go home. And the next day, we you know, we were out in the fields farming or fixing something on the farm, doing just regular stuff. Your dad was a farmer. That's what that, what he did? Yeah. What kind, of, what kind of farm? That's interesting. It's uh, it's oats. You know, we sell, uh, sell the oats for, for seed. Wow. So you grew up on a... So you didn't grow up in Oslo then? I didn't. I lived there for ten years, but that was that was later. Well, I kind of, I grew up there too, you know. But I was uh, I was born here, and then so the barn I'm in now is uh, the barn on the family farm, and uh, one third of it is now a studio because, um, yeah, our father is you know he's relentless. He he he's enthusiastic and he never stops working. As I've seen him laying down on the couch maybe twice. <laughs> <laughs> So wait a minute. Yeah. So those pictures that you showed me, uh, the video, are those your family's houses? Yeah, that's. The I didn't know that. Oh my god, that's this guy's farm is beautiful, man. It's like, like Nebraska somewhere. It's just like, yeah. go, holy crap, it's gorgeous. Thank you. Wow, I didn't realize that that was all your family's property. That is so cool. It is. So, so my mom is uh, seventh generation on this farm, and um, I was supposed to take over, but you know, I'm not going to do that because. I have I have a family on my own and also I travel a lot and but you know I, uh, up until the age of thirty when my first bo- daughter was born I was pretty destined to be a be a farmer you know how did you get uh, how did you sort of like Believe come it. to well how did you come to the conclusion no that's the wrong question how did you how did you break the news to your dad and mom. I just uh, I just did it, and they took it really well. Okay, that's good. Because this music thing is also something my dad dad kind of started, you know, and yeah. encouraged, and has been encouraging. They both have been in, encouraging this all along, you know. So 
he could totally see that. Um, and another thing, being a musician and being a farmer is some is two kind of professions you could think about being very flexible, but they're really not. No, they're not. Being a farmer is like 24-7, man. That's like one of the toughest businesses you could ever have. Yeah, yeah. It's I have tremendous respect for the mm -hmm. farmers and, and their know-how and their will of steel, you know. And yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm just um, I'm just a big farm nut, you know. I I love tractors. I love uh, combine harvesters. Uh, for my 40th birthday, my wife she she uh, she chipped in some money for the black strat, and uh, and also she she uh, arranged for me to have a ride along on this massive fent tractor <laughs> that's so cool and, and and i'm you know i'm crying because i'm so happy <laughs> no man i get it it's like it's a it's very similar to music it's a very uh organic natural pure thing to be out there on a farm i mean it's beautiful yeah wow that's so cool i had no idea that's beautiful man that's how you grew up that's awesome very cool yeah um okay so but i was asked uh what which question was i answering Ah, oh, just the first one, man. You, you got your notes there. Somebody, you know, one time somebody uh, filled out all the questions and sent it back to me. And I, so I said, I said, Am I, do you want me to grade it? I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And so I just put it like, like an E, like for excellent. And I circled it and I sent it back. <laughs> awesome. You know, just automatically generated podcast. You know, you... you so the question is, then you have like this automatic answering machine just reading. <laughs> it was funny, know. man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? Let me ask you this. Um, I just to educate me and people here in the states about Norway. So I did a very minimal research. There's five and a half million in people, five and a half million people in Norway, spread out over a territory about half the size of Texas or 80% of the size of California. So there's a very, you know, that's not densely populated at all. Yet the country has the fourth highest per capita income in the world. So what are the primary industries in Norway and what are some of the, to, to the extent you can talk about them, primary cultural and musical differences between Norway and the States here? That's interesting. I think um, to, to answer the first question, uh, the primary industries in Norway is fish and oil. Okay. And Norway used to be a really poor country up until 1969 before they found oil in, in vast amounts. So this whole, this whole country is uh, it's, it's based upon our, our, um, our system is based upon that, that wealth that the oil, oil gave us and also fish. So I know fish, like there's a lot of, you guys harvest a lot of krill, don't you? Yeah. And we have sal salmon. Yeah. Especially salmon. You know, we export salmon to uh, the Asian market, the Japanese market. They use it for sushi. Wow. That's a big thing here. Um, and we're, you know, I think we're dabbling in some technology too, because, you know, you, you, kinda, you can kind of see the writing on the wall that, you know, that oil thing is not going to, Last forever, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. So we are now trying to steer everybody into the um, what we call the the green shift or the green, you know, the new green era. Sure. We have a lot of people working in the oil industry here, but you know, a lot for us. And and also, it's kind of interesting. Um, there is practically nobody living here. I know. I can, that's so like sparsely. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, do they, also, is it easy? Like if I wanted to move there, is it hard to come in? Uh, I think it's okay. Okay. Uh, it depends. Uh, I think it's easy from the States or from the EU. Right. Like that. I just heard that it was, uh, almost impossible from the Philippines for some reason. I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know, but you yeah. know, we've been having a right wing government for, for some time now. And that, that kind of right, it's kind of bracing through everything. So, so it's been, I think it's been stricter. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, 
culturally, what are the primary differences culturally and musically between Norway and the States? I think one of the biggest differences culturally is we trust the government a lot. Wow. Yeah. That is a huge difference. That is. And, you know, that's just such a big thing, you know, having that trust in the authorities uh, planted upon each and every one living here. And that kind of seeps through everything we do. And that kind of, uh, that's also a big thing when it comes to governing people, you know, uh, telling people what to do, not what not to do. And we kind of abide 98% of the time. You know? Wow. So there's a lot less stress as well. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, um, you can, you know, you you can argue with, you can argue with the government and all that, and that's fine. And you can complain about stuff. And, and some people, as some stuff are valid to complain about, but, you know, if you zoom out and, and look at the world as a whole, or even just the West as a whole, mm -hmm. the way we're living here is, is not even part of reality, you know? Okay. Yeah. We, we, we shouldn't really be co complaining about anything. And so people are able to have that uh, thirty thousand hot the foot view from the that that they are in a good place. No, oh, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Both, you know. But I think it's interesting. I think somebody said that you know uh, how you know the the more money you make and the better you have it, the worse you have it, something like that. So mm. you know, uh, the bigger life you lead, you know, the the bigger the smaller things get. Sure. So people here are complaining about, you know, what everybody else is complaining about. You know, the taxes are too high and uh, gasoline is cost them as, gasoline costs them as much and, you know, the price of electricity. So it's, it's, it's the same. Same, yeah. And also, I don't think Norway has, uh, might go out on a limb here, but I don't think Norway has become a, a warmer country um, the last, I don't know, last... 10 years it's uh i think yeah, unfortunately i think it's becoming more and more about protecting what we have and being more skeptical uh when towards immigrants you know yeah it's just like this is a small part of it but i can see i don't think it's it's not moving in a, in a positive direction you know and you can kind of see the whole thing uh, the same thing through throughout europe and and, and the states uh, here of course yeah Wow, that's too bad. Uh, yeah, it's 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 sad. It's alarming. M musically, you know, here in the states, as you probably know, the 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 you know, there's less places to play. Culturally, people listen to their headphones. There, there's DJs coming in instead of bands. What is it like over in Norway musically? Well, that kind of how people use music you know that that shift you just described yeah that's going on here too you know? okay so being played on the radio used to be a big thing now everybody makes their own radio you know yeah play, you know right uh, when i this this example when i played on the national tv when i was 16 that was another thing uh i think 1.1 million people saw it holy crap had one channel you know and uh, and now that's gone you know of course you have netflix you have hbo we have everything sure but the impact the impact you could have if you were on national tv on a saturday night was just tremendous oh you launch your whole career yeah 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 and you could get a flying start because everybody saw it there was nothing else to see yeah maybe you had a vcr player but i wouldn't count on it so Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a similar cultural, musical culture as it is here in the States with things shrinking and changing yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. But the good thing here is, you know, since, um, excuse me, since, since uh, the, we have all this oil money, the, the government has been spending that money for, for many, many years to try to avoid, since there's so few people here, they spend that money trying to broaden the cultural scope. So uh, people that do kind of narrow stuff, you know, and shouldn't uh, necessarily attract a big crowd mm. to make a living out of it, they can get government found funding. So, uh, and I think it's kind of to, to um, 
even out our little disability when it comes to how many people you can actually play to. Right. So like I know in Sweden, their the, their government is super supportive of the arts. Like they give you places to rehearse and things like that. Is that sort of similar? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. That's so cool. It might be even better than in Sweden too. Yeah, that's great. And you can, you know, and, and on, the, on the other hand, uh, you can say that uh, the music industry in Sweden is like a music industry. Like they're really good at it. Yes. Since ABBA. And I think they're, they used to be the third, the third biggest exporting um, music. Um, the, the third, <laughs> I'm sorry. They used to be the third biggest music is exporters. Per capita. In the oh, I didn't realize that. I'm not surprised because I've talked to so many great Swedish musicians, so I'm not surprised. But wow, that's a big number, man. Yeah. Like when you think about the U.S. and England, just the size of them is so much bigger than Sweden. Wow. Yeah. And they come in third. That's that's great, man. That's crazy. It's really cool. And so they have to come to the same thing. But um, what happens is um, when you get government funding, I think maybe – that has been leading to the Norwegian music uh, industry as this is sales organization uh, has been not really up to speed um, up until the last, maybe the last five to six years. Now we're, you know, now we're getting into gear and uh, we're exporting some really good pop acts and uh, we have really good jazz, black metal. You know, that's the big You're thing. kind of known for black metal there, death metal stuff. Right, right. Fish oil and death metal. Fish oil and death metal. Yeah, that's the way to go. <laughs> so those of you looking for some good stocks, Norwegian stocks. Um, yeah. What were some of your challenges early on as far as getting your career, your music career up and going? I think on a, on a personal level, it was, um, I was really, I was really angry when I was uh, growing up. I didn't feel, uh, understood or uh, i just had all this energy that i didn't know how where to place and uh, when i when i started playing gigs more that helped you know i just uh, that was my channel I've to express to, to leak to drip the anger out yeah yeah that's cool turn it into energy and i think it just in the end came out as this uh, will to perform and you know mold each night into a different thing you know and it, you know it should be something else when you're finished than it was when you started and that that will to to make something out of what you have that night you know um what happened for for me was when i was 18 i got my driver's license because you have to be 18 in norway i went to oslo and that was a big thing you know a farm boy coming from in sure. Big city. Yeah, yeah. It's like oh, holy shit! And and driving I had a Mazda. I had a baby blue Mazda pickup. <laughs> Always wanted a pickup, but I that was what. What I kind of pickup? For. Baby blue Mazda. You know. Mazda. Oh, Mazda. Okay. Yep. And it was running on three cylinders. Get out of here. Yeah, and my uh, actually my grandmother bought it for me. Oh, that's cool. That's so sweet. mm Hmm. I was really proud of that, yeah, that that car. So I, anyway, I, I went into Oslo and um, uh, they had just established a blues club called uh, Muddy Waters. Hmm. And all the pros were hanging out there and all the pros were playing there. And um, it was just like, uh, I was just really lucky because this guy um, called R.C. Finnegan, he was up there and he was leading the band through the, yeah, it was a, jam session on Sundays, you know, and there was a country and on Mondays and they had a house band, you know, and they were really busy. And then uh, my friend, Kid Anderson, you know, who now lives in California. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's on that uh, blues, re on the blues, the, the label record that you guys have. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And he plays with the Nightcats. He's just, just phenomenal, just tremendously good. And he was in the house band and he, uh, he got a, I think he might correct me, but I think he got um, uh, an offer to come to the States with the, the saxophone player, uh, Terry Hank. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that, that spot for the guitar, you know, that spot was opening up. 
And after a couple of Sundays sitting on the, in at the jam, you know, being really nervous and, and all that. Because this was the, the kind of place where all my heroes used to hang out. And, sure. and drink, you know, all the, the biggest guitar players in Norway came there. So, um, well, we ended up, I ended up in the house band along with my brother because I told him, you know, I have a brother and he's a really good drummer. Oh, really? And uh, the bass player was uh, Bill Troiani. He's now a dear friend of us. Uh, he's from New York. That's why. And what's he, what was he doing in... That's weird. What the hell was he doing in Norway? Same thing. Every American musician who moves to Norway does. You know, he he, um, he was married to a Norwegian girl. Oh, right, right. Because I had... You happen to know a guy named Pete Abbott? Drummer? That sounds familiar. Uh, he was... He lived in Norway for nine years. He's not there now, but he lived in Norway for nine years. Same thing. He married a Norwegian girl. Mm -hmm. That's wild, man. We got some pretty girls here, you know. And you do, man. Yeah, and um, so he was there, and and I'll I'll never be able to thank Bill enough because he he taught us so much. We ended up playing with him six nights a week. Wow. And that's, we kind of formed my first solo band was Bill and, and my brother and me. Yeah. We played three sets a night and he taught us how to, to jam and stretch out. You know, he recorded every show on his MP3 player. Uh, so he, he was just tapping the board. Mm -hmm. the and, you know, when you play a small club, what, what's it going to have in the board? It's just bass drum and a lot of vocals. You know? Yeah. It's, it's just it's like listening to yourself having sex or something it's just <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know it, it taught us a lot and and then and then every month we had a different guest coming in uh so, so there was uh jam on sunday we played country every monday since i was even then you know a big country fan trying to play country guitar and then uh, every month we had uh, had a guest uh, usually from the states so who did you back up? Well, uh, we backed up. Uh, well, it was Dave Herrero. Is originally from from Florida. Uh, he lives in Chicago now. Great guitar player. And I'm trying to think of you know we played with um, the rhythm guitar player who used to play with uh, Albert King and Freddie King. Oh, the uh, the lady. Larry, uh, no, it was Larry Larry Burton. Larry. Oh, I should get my facts straight, man. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, Larry Burton. Yeah. Wow. And he was a he was a rhythm guitar player for Albert King, and, and Albert Collins or Freddie uh, King. Or wow. Okay, Albert Collins. Sorry, so you said yeah. That's awesome. And just listening to him playing a funky guitar groove in E, just wow. So that was like great. Being in the house band of Muddy Waters was incredible tuition for you, like. Fantastic! Yeah, three sets a night, and and uh, every every set you you wanted to win, you know. So you kind of played. You didn't play three sets; you played three concerts. Yeah, and uh, also we played at this boat in Oslo, uh, down by the pier, and uh, so I, my record is eleven sets a day. Eleven and, sets. Yeah, that was the record. Wow. We did four sets at the boat. Then if the weather was good and the, the crowd were coming in, they would kind of uh, pay us per set after that. Uh, I, what's the math? So we played three sets of Muddy Waters at the end of the night. Then uh, we played at the, at the boat first. But it turned out to be 11 sets. That's was, incredible, man. We had slow blues, you know, and, and up falls after soul. It was like a concert day too. Because I wow. I want to see people to listen to <laughs> That's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, that's incredible. And you did that for how long? Uh, a couple of years, three years, four years. Wow. So, and how far away did you live from there, or did you uh, grow up from Oslo? That's I. Uh, I think I had an apartment. I I eventually moved to Oslo, but before that, I had an apartment in Lillestrøm. That's like between here and Oslo, maybe thirty five minutes from here. Because I, okay. I didn't want to go to the military, so I had to do this, what we call the civilian service. So okay, like the reserves, they have it here. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. You, have to, you have to have like, a, you, you can't have a real job, but you have to be uh, somewhere where people work. So I was stationed at a, a high school. 
So I taught this kid how to play music and I bought some equipment and, you know, but at the same time I was playing six, six nights a week. So I was like getting no sleep. So I, I, I was sleeping in this office in the school because they hardly ever needed me. So I was just sleeping there. So is that compulsory military service in Norway? Yeah, it used to be. And then you had to have like this interrogation um, to get out of it. Uh, but now I think, they mostly uh, draft people who want it themselves. You know, how, how old was did you, back when it was mandatory? How how old were you when you went in the service? I was nineteen or twenty. No. Okay, so at least a little older. Like in Israel, they take your life. Think when you're like sixteen. That's really young, man. Oh, wow, and it's mandatory there. Yeah. yeah, for a couple of years, I believe. Wow. Okay. Um. All right. So you're playing in Muddy Waters. What made you finally say, I need to take this show on the road and cut the cord here? It kind of happened because, uh, oh, before we move on, I'm sorry. One night we were there playing and it was a, it was a jam session. You know who walks in the door? Brian Setzer. Really? Brian From the Stray Setzer. Cats. That's pretty yeah. cool. He played in Oslo the same night. And uh, some friends of ours were like, they were talking to him and then you want to check out some music? There's a club right up here. And it's like, oh, whatever. Okay, and he cool. came in. Did he play with you guys? He played with us for an hour. Oh, that's awesome. I was like, and I gave him, it didn't look like this. This It used to be a, a beautiful sunburst. But I gave him this, plugged into a reissue basement and he, basement, and he looked at it and said, well, this is not my brand. And then he played <laughs> 60 hours, 60 minutes. That's cool, man. Whole set. That's and nice. After, after that, I saw the DVD, the, the uh, Brian Setzer Orchestra from, from Tokyo. So I was kind of, my mind was blown after the fact. Yep. Thankfully, you know, yeah. I was up there trying to kick his ass, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> kind of why that was Brian Setzer. What a, what a, what a cool guy. That was amazing. Uh, but what happened was, uh, uh, how should I put this? The guy that released the Label Mates album that you've been listening to? Yeah. He came up to me then in 2002 at Muddy Waters and said, because well, he's been listening to me then for, I don't know, a year. Because he, he just was a, he used to come there to hang out to look for bands. Yeah. Yeah. So he wanted to make an album with me. And Bill and Henrik, and uh, so we did. And uh, we went to Nordhavn again, mm -hmm. big blues hub in Norway. And um, there was C Six Steve. You know uh, who that is? No. He um, he had a big breakthrough on Jules Holland. What's his name? C Six Steve. He plays with a three string cigar box guitar. No, I don't know him. Trumpel Jones for Se from Zeppelin played yeah. bass with him. I didn't know that. I don't know. C six C six Steve. Yeah. What a name. Yeah. Great guy. Amazing guy. And he produced the whole album and recorded it in his studio then because he had the old equipment from Stax in no problem. <laughs> How the hell did he get that there? I don't know. <laughs> wow. It sounds crazy when I explain it like this, where but it, that that actually happened. So C six Steve produced your first record. Did. Now, which one was that? Was that one uh, fried? Rips, rips stripped and southern fried. Yeah, that's a. Let me go over there. Um, it's a great record, man. It's funny because the, uh, you know, I saw videos of you playing the, the the video of the grand show. You were so young there, and this you're even younger. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was twenty, twenty two. Yeah, it was even. Let me ask you a question about that grand show. Um. You guys seem like very, very well rehearsed. Yeah, that's all we did. Yeah, but I didn't even see, usually you see the band leader looking around, you know, I did, you, it was none of that. You were just, it was a very tranquil vibe between all of you guys. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you must have been very well rehearsed. To, to be in that phase we were and yeah. and another thing what what happens i think when you play that much together with people you know that well 
you stop looking at them for you know you don't need to you connect through the music instead of connecting through the looks yeah i i played i've i've been playing with my brother for 30 years yeah uh maybe more 32 years or something i haven't i haven't seen him i haven't looked at him you know last 15 years yeah that's pretty <laughs> i hear him yeah <laughs> Well, you mentioned earlier something about keyboard players. The keyboard player in the uh, Amgala band, holy shit, that guy was, yeah, yeah. wow, that was great to hear him, man. And you have to check out his band. It's called uh, Yaga Yassist. Spell that. Uh, it's J-A-G-A. -A. Right. Uh, and uh, space and mm -hmm. like jazz mm -hmm. and I-S-T. Yaga ist. Okay, yeah, just like you said it. Okay, cool. Yeah, he was phenomenal, man. He did a great job in there. That whole band was was just Now your brother was not playing drums in there, was he? No, he's not. He's uh we've been um after I joined forces with the Lucky Lips, uh he's got a kid now and he's also working for the streaming service. He's like a content provider for a streaming service called Moon In. Okay. Right. So um no, he's he's been dialing really dialing back his uh, his live, yeah, gates. live gates. Yeah, I totally he, get that. But he runs the studio. You know, he's he's been my uh, he's been my main technical enabler for I don't know so many years. Yeah. I'd come up with an idea, and he's like, "Yeah, how about this?" You know, he's, he he welds, he solders, he he does his. It's very different from me, and I think that's the reason why we work so well together. Sure. It's, it's like the technical brain of it all. Uh, side note, COVID, what was, I don't know, how, how locked down was, was Norway? It was pretty locked down. Uh, yeah. especially in the cities, you had to, you know, it was, uh, they had to stay, stay indoors. Yeah. Everything was closed, shopping malls, cultural centers, concert venues, everything was closed down for a long, long time. And uh, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be, you know, we're going to see the effects. I think worldwide, we're going to see the effects, like the, the psychological effect of COVID. It's probably going to be in play for the next few years, I think. Lots of students being really lonely. Oh, um, well, you know what I saw that was bad? I read some articles like, um, you know, in South America, where the countries are not, they're poor to start with and um they shut schools down there was no zoom which it's i can't imagine making kids study on zoom but um and a lot of these kids they so they basically miss school for two years mm. and you got to these poor communities like what do you think they're going to be doing i yeah. mean it's just so i yeah, i agree with you i think it's gonna be seen what um is it back is it opening back up now for you guys like are they starting to it is it is uh and our numbers you know much i think much because of what i said earlier how about uh, about how how much uh trust we put in our government uh our numbers has been really low and people have been doing what they've been told okay uh well the prime minister had a little party and she got a fine oh my god she was like celebrating her 60th birthday or something you know, with a sushi party with one of the closest friends, you know, it was just too many of them. <laughs> Man, these people, like these politicians, they're just so out of touch with, with the working, the everyday working person. I mean, it's, it's the same thing here, man. They just like do as I say, not as I do. That's not a good, it's not good as a father. It's not good as a politician either, man. You know, you can't do that shit. Shouldn't be smoking, you know. Yeah, right, right. Shouldn't be smoking, right. It's bad for you. Yeah. So, um, but other than that, our, our numbers been really low. And 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 another thing, uh, the 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 life we have here in Norway, you know, it has its pluses and minuses. But you know, if you just zoom out and look at Brazil, look at you know anywhere, look at the U.S., you know, we we've been really lucky. Hmm. We, we've been locked up. We've been everything was gone all the gigs all the you know nothing happened for for months and months and months but um very few people died and uh i got my first shot to so gonna get get my second shots and that's been taking a long time but still 
we can't complain yeah. at all. Did you get sick at all or you, you passed over? No, it's good. I had the shot and, but I was really, really careful when this, when this thing came because my, my, my wife has this chronic disease called the uh, Crohn's. Oh my God. Yeah. My, my brother had that. It's, it's in uh, our like intestinal. Yes. Yeah. Plumbing. Yeah. That's, she's gotta be super. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so she's in like a, in the risk. Yeah. Really sick, you know? So I was really, really careful. And, um, so, so I've been just driving around on my moped, you know, she bought me a moped for me to keep saying. You got a good wife. She gives you a moped. She bought, put you on the tractor. She buys me guitars. And she buys you guitars. Look, I guess you, you got 17 years. You're going to get another 17 at least, man. I could tell you right now. He's my best friend. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, did you get anything out of COVID? Like like all the isolate, like did any sort of uh, new ideas or uh, anything learned, anything positive come out of COVID for you or your family? Lots of songs. Oh, you did a lot of writing. Yeah. I think I wrote maybe like three albums. Wow. Yeah, I'm just sitting in my small office, you know, uh, at home with Logic, a couple of speakers and just churning out tunes, you know. That was really good. That was like, uh, yeah. And I felt and I kind of felt um uh this this whole new uh possibility of digging deeper into songwriting and uh I'm not saying that the songs are better than before, but you know, this this that you don't have to finish the song the same day as it started because I used to write one song a day and then make the demo and just, that's it, you know. And 10 days, you have 10 songs. But now you, so you go back. You took the pressure off yourself. It did. That's great. So now I would imagine that you will keep that pressure off. Like you won't all of a sudden go back to saying, oh, I got to write a song a day and do a demo. No. Yeah, that's much, great. Much easier about it. and, and That's good. I think also when you when you've proven proven to yourself that you can make a song, uh, you don't have to write a song unless you really have something to say. Yeah, you're not forced to. Man, I got to come up with something here. You that's can cool. Come up with something, but you know that's going to be uh, just the, the construction of it is just going to be the know how and the craft. But you know, I think the content has to come before the craft. Yeah, that's cool. I'm, so. I'm so you got something. So you got, sorry, let me cut you off. I apologize. Go ahead. But I was going to say, so, so for you, you attained, you were able to relax about your songwriting. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool, man. And I didn't have to go anywhere because I'm not a, you know, I'm not a big fan of traveling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you were at one time. Well, but now you got a family, so it's a little different. Yeah, it's yeah. different. Then I, I, I got so much closer to my, my girls. You know, I have two girls. They're eight and ten. And uh, since they were homeschooled, you know, I uh, took the opportunity to dress up as a different teacher every day. <laughs> That's cute, man. <laughs> Big and everything, you know. And using oranges as breasts, you know. I just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had lots of fun. That's great. That's hilarious. But what about all the other fruit out there? You neglected them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, they're, they're eight and ten, so I just I stuck with the oranges, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. You played teacher. That's good, man. So you you got like your family intimacy, which is nice, man. Yeah. Yeah, we did oh. the same thing. Yeah. 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 That's and cool, man. And and another thing is that when you have, uh, I, I've always been like this home, kind of homey person. I like to stay home and, and be around my family. And uh, when you have like this, the world's greatest excuse for not going anywhere, as COVID was, you know. Right. <laughs> Just, and and uh, it kind of takes a lot of pressure off uh, and nobody was doing anything, so you weren't kind of you weren't missing out or anything because nothing was happening. Yeah, you know. So um, I bought a lawnmower with um with a snowplow. Right. I bought a snowblower that you could walk walk behind, you know, and I sold both of them because they stopped working. You know, stuff like that in the garage. I would I would think many people have done some projects. You know. Yeah. Here <laughs> it was 
people did so much work on their homes, like home, all the big retail, Home Depot, all the major, there's nothing in these stores. Online, I was selling, I don't know, like an, a pair of bike shoes that I had and like five people in the first 15 minutes called me up and I'm like, what's going on? It's like, like, and it was a new pair. It's something I hadn't used and they said, there's none out there because everybody's bought you know, people are doing, they can't go to gym, so they're doing bicycling and they're doing all this stuff. So everybody, you know, is so it, pretty busy ants there for a while. Busy yeah. Busy. It was crazy. Nothing, everything. Yeah. And then, then you see, now you can see the, the price of timber. I don't know how it is in the States, but the prices of timber here has gone up. Like some products have gone, gone up 100%, 100%. It's gone up so high that, when you go and look at it, if you're looking, my wife's a realtor, so I, I, I'm sort of tapped into all this. Uh, if you go look at a new community and you put, and you're looking at building a home, you have to put a deposit down because if you don't, if you come back next week, it'll be thirty or forty thousand dollars more. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's just insane the timber situation. Yeah, nice. really insane. Um. I want to talk about some of your music, man. You're a super talented guy. Uh, I listened to like pretty much, I think, everything of yours, and I got a lot out of every one of them. Um, but I want to ask you about some of uh, my favorites. So let me pull up here. Yeah. Uh, you're let, out. Let me, just, let me just quickly just thank you for diving. So you've been so thorough. You're diving deep into all the catalog, and just thank you, man. That means a lot. Oh, you man! It was a, it was easy. You're welcome. But man, I liked it. it. Was like great music. So it wasn't like I, I wasn't suffering through any of it. Trust me. It was. It, you're very cool. How, how you go about this? You just you, you just take it so insanely serious. I, I really appreciate that. Oh because man, thank you. Has been. You know, there's a lot of thoughts going into to making music. You know. Oh my god! And, yeah, and it's not an easy thing. You know, and 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 you know, my whole since I've done this show. Uh, four years now and uh, like like 850 episodes i've learned you know i don't i don't i know it's crazy i don't ever like i used to have a mindset oh i would dismiss something i don't like because i don't like it but now it's simply because i i am so aware of the energy and effort that goes into making music i don't dismiss anything i may not enjoy some of it but i don't dismiss it you know i find things in it you know, although I got to admit, there's been a couple of people that wanted to come on the show and I booked them and then I listened to this stuff and I, I'm like, I couldn't, I couldn't say, tell somebody to listen to it. It was just bad for me anyway. But, uh, in your case, it was not, I mean, totally opposite. I mean, I'm, I'm a blues guy. I love everything you do. Um, you have an album called dirt, uh, yes. w which is really funny too. One of the, the cover of that, you look like you're about just like before you get ready to commit murder, you took that picture. <laughs> really thick earrings. It doesn't show on the picture too well, but no, it does. You can see it. My my, it used to be my wife's favorite picture of me. You know? Yeah, yeah. You look pr pretty tough. Like I wouldn't want. To, like I better like that music is how I felt. But um, you have a song in there called "Anywhere You Go." Yeah. And man, I thought it was such a good, you know, we talked about music licensing uh, mm -hmm. earlier before we started recording. That could be the chase scene of a movie. It could be the opening credits of a TV show or like just the song that makes everybody get out of their seats at a party and start dancing. And, and what I thought was great was you did it. You did a really good job of the arrangements on Moon, but you also, you know, you put in horns, mm -hmm. but you use them just right and i think there's always a temptation where hey we got the horns today let's like you know let's let's use the horns but you didn't do that not one bit you, you did a, you used them exactly where you needed to and I, so i was just curious about the backstory to that track and and with you yeah. know the horn placement and stuff that track was um it's 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 a long time now ago now but that, that track was really cool to to do, I think the basis of the track is uh, this rhythm box and this homemade organ that some guy uh, just left here. Oh wow! <laughs> and it's called the Doctor Rhythm. <laughs> uh, no, it's called uh, yeah or or Bohemot or something. It was a German. It's a German organ he put together, and the rhythm box was kind of cool. So we stuck a mic on that, 
uh, and recorded that for as long as we felt we needed to. Um, then at, at that time, we had a horn section consisting of three guys, uh, baritone, sax, uh, trumpet, and trombone. And uh, so, I, so they have to take credit for the, the um, tastefulness in the horn arrangement there. Uh, they're really, really, really good guys. And, um, and then we had uh, Karina um, Dahl. Uh, no, sorry, uh, Karina Moon. She was a um, guest singer. Did I send you the video? No. There's a music video to it. We recorded down here. It used to be a pig barn down here. So we recorded it. That's wild. And we didn't have a light man, you know, lighting technician. So we just flicked a light switch. Oh, that's wild. Because my mother used to grow um, fungus down here, uh, like this gourmet fungus. Oh, like, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Not, not edibles, but, you know. It's, yeah. Uh, no, because yeah. they're like, it's like, uh, yeah, King mushrooms. Oyster. Yeah. King oyster mushroom. That's so, wild. Yeah, it was really cool. And she had this... Um, this bins, these containers where she grew them because she was simulating all the, all the four seasons to make the mushroom grow faster. So the walls were white. I'll send you this video. Yeah, man. I'd love to see that. We just set up down there and uh, filming and just flicking the light switch, you know, make it look really spooky because when you turn the lights off and it's pitch black, then you change positions, you turn the lights back on. Oh, cool. Heat it up so you're like... You know, yeah, that's very cool. Very DIY. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a good, but uh, and so so these three guys came up with their own horn parts. Yeah, I think they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really cool. Yeah. I, I love that try. You, when you said mushrooms, made me think of something. Is weed legal in Norway? No, not at all. Not even medi- for medicine, medicinal. Well, we're I think we're softening up on the medicinal hmm. angle of it. Yeah, but I think it's it's you know it's uh, no that it's going to be. Many many years from now, really, yeah. is you know you don't have to say anything about yourself, but is is weed a common thing for musicians to be smoking or not really, kinda, or is it, the penalties there are so yeah. stiff? It it depends it, it depends on the genre. Yeah, it depends on on uh, which kind of musicians. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I tried it twice: once in Norway and once in Amsterdam with my wife. We went to this coffee shop and I oh in Amsterdam, uh, yeah, 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 just. The, the thing you have to do, you know. Sure, of course. It was called Purple Haze. And it looked like <laughs> it was like this cold, you know. Mm-hmm. And she was lighting up a regular cigarette because we used both to be smoking back then, you know. Right. She was like, what are, you, what are you doing? Get out, get out. Smoking cigarettes? No, no, no. That's bad for you. <laughs> oh, my God. So you could smoke weed in there, but not cigarettes. Exactly. Wow. That's a purist. And then I rode the ba- a bike back to the hotel and she was like, I'm an- Watch the road. Watch the road. <laughs> yeah, that's not something I would do on a. <laughs> I can barely talk, let alone ride a bike. Good for you. <laughs> so it, so it varies, but I wouldn't say it's uh, it's it's not too common actually. And yeah. It's, uh, and also for for every generation of musicians, I think everybody's straightening up a bit. Uh, Nobody is drunk anymore on stage. Nobody is, you know. Nobody really does anything bad anymore. You know? It's the same thing here for the most part. People are pretty serious. I mean, the people feel pretty grateful to be able to do that for a living. They're not people, professionals take it seriously. They're not, you know, coming on stage hammered at all. No. You've been thinking about that gig for three weeks, you know, and then you're going to just blow it. Yeah. yeah. Plus my, my guests tend to be a little older as well. So they're like, physically they're like, no, I'm done. I don't, I need to go to the gym tomorrow morning. You know, I don't want to, you know, yeah. It's a different ball game. And it has to be. You got, you got, I want to talk about some more music. You got another track called, uh, shine it around. Shine it all around. Yeah. Shine it all around. Um, it's a single, um, Hmm. Even the cover of that, it's like some beautiful forest or something. It's a really nice yeah. picture. Um, beautiful track, really moving. It sounds like you got like a resonator slide on there. It's a cigar box guitar we bought on the street. Oh, cool. With a P bass microphone. And the thing is falling apart now because we, we've been using it a lot. You know, but we glued it back together. <laughs> Three bass strings. That's really, it, it sounds great, man. 
Thank you. That's that's actually written for this TV documentary because uh, I write I, I wrote um, the intro music for it. Then we made the music for the whole uh, the whole series the first year, and it's still running. I think it's on its ninth or tenth year. Wow, that's a that's cool. Do we get Norwegian shows here sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and mm-hmm. what they do, I. I can't watch it if it's not in English. Like some people, they'll either they have it like um, the people are talking in Norwegian, but they overdub it in English. I can't. My mind doesn't process that because, like, I know they're not saying that, so the words and music don't match, sort of. So I have a hard time yeah. taking it in. My 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 younger son always watches shows like that, but um, there's quite a like. Uh, there was one they had. It was in English. It was a lot of cop shows in Europe in general. There's a lot of really good. Cop, murder, mysteries, suspense, kind of things. Especially yeah. in Germany and in uh, in England. Yeah, England. We get a lot, we don't get any German shows here. Funny enough, we get a lot of English shows. Few Norway, uh, Sweden. You know, some of the Scandinavian countries uh, or the Northern Europe countries, I should say. Um, it's. It, I like I seeing it. What's that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that we were exporting like cultural. Yeah. Like, TV shows. It like, was real, and I love that because I like to see other places. Because everything is different. Like even the the way a police the architecture of a police of a police station and then the build and the way it's laid out. So it's always like really interesting to see that for me anyway, uh yeah. just the differences. You know. And I, I mean I think we could always learn a lot from different things anyway, too. So uh you know, it's just cool. You know, it's glass and concrete. But it's it but it right, it is, but it's different, you know? It's it's just um yeah, but that track was great. You and your brother wrote that really good. Uh, you you have an album called Electric, which is a great, man, what a great, great blues album. Um, and your song on there called Stay A While. Yeah. First of all, I thought that whole record was just first class. There was some really good blues riffs in there, really good songs, and v- all of them were very moving um, and very soulful. And to the point where I was curious what was going on in your life when that record was being made, because you had some sort of like magic going there. Yeah. I, um, that record was actually really important because that was the first record we made here in the barn hmm. after moving the studio from Oslo, because there was this biker gang in the next room and they were starting up their bikes and they were smuggling, uh, smuggling uh, liquor. And they were, you know, that's so they, funny. That's like a TV show. Yeah, yeah, we were really, it was, it was like Sons of Anarchy. You know? Yeah. And I can be hot headed, you know. So, what I did, I took two four by 10 Marshall cabinets, stuck it in the hallway. <laughs> one basement had one Marshall 100 watt head, and just cranked it. And I started playing. And like 30 seconds later, this biker dude, he's not that tall, but he's crazy. He was there in the doorway like this, you know, he wanted to kill me. And uh, stuff like that, you know. He, the, the other guy, was kind of acting as if he was running over my brother on a motorbike. Holy! Full on throttle, you know, towards my brother. And he's a stubborn bastard, you know. So he he didn't move. He was like this. <laughs> then he just pulled in the the brakes and stopped like this close to him. Wow! Was, yeah, that's too much stress to be dealing with. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't nice at all. Then you know, again, I called my father, and he was like. Yeah, let's move in here. <laughs> okay, cool. And he had two carpenters that were working on the other side of the barn. He moved them here, and we he made this room, and we um, just it's beautifully done. And that was the first record we made on the. It's recorded on analog tape, and and also since the grand was breaking up, uh, the band, yeah, the band, uh, it was breaking up while we were in Oslo because they were getting. We were broke, and uh, there was. They started to getting getting jobs. They they, they were going to school. What happened? Yeah. What, what like? How, okay, so take me through the trajectory of that. Like, because you guys were like on Rock Palace. Yeah, not that nothing, fans on Rock Palace don't break up, but what what happened? Nothing happened. We were on the Ross Kilda. We played the second yeah. biggest Ross Kilda. It was like twelve thousand people there, and. I don't know. We just lost momentum. I think if we had made another another album, uh, you know, just st- stuck with it a, a, a bit longer, 
something would have happened. Mm. I don't know. Also, I think we kind of missed that whole wolf mother wave by six months or something. Okay. I don't know. But, you know, the music we made was the music we wanted to make. So it's great music, man. It was a lot of fun. It was so cool watching you play that SG, man. It was because you don't yeah. see, you don't, I don't know, you don't see a lot of that music being played anymore, period. But let alone, on, it was just cool to have the SG there, man. And you know why? Live at Leeds. Oh, that's what a great record. My God. I was so happy when they finally released the long version of that. I don't know if you know that the original version was much shorter. Oh. Yeah, the the album, like the actual Live at Leeds album when it came out, it was like 25, 35 minutes long. And then I don't know when they started putting CDs out and stuff. They released Live at Leeds, the whole concert, which was like, you know, whatever, 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, exactly. I think yeah. I've been looking for the long one then because right. when I'll never forget when track 11 is called Sparks. Mm -hmm. That's a great track. And then Pete Townsend plays a guitar solo using a, an Octavio, you know, the Roger Mayer Octavio pedal. Mm -hmm. And I was crying. And it was like, is, is, is it possible to, to conceive all this beauty and madness into <laughs> a four-piece band? Oh, that was, that was mind-blowing and, and life-changing hearing that album. So I started playing SGs and I had a, a lot of them. Uh, they're gone now. <laughs> Got rid of yours. They're hard to play with the. the I never could. I had one. It was. I loved it, but I never played it because the neck, the the neck was heavier than the body. Yeah, yeah. It's hard See, to get used to. You don't ever do the. Everybody clap your hands. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some player going, "Hey." Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Not so the good. so so the gram was breaking up. I'm sorry, and then. You put you started putting the studio together, yeah, and and uh, the ground was breaking up, uh, you know, kind of dissolving. And I was still in the studio every day writing songs, and the songs I wrote uh, initially they were for the Grand's uh, second album, but since the band broke up and we were moving here, it turned out to be uh, the, the songs for Electric. So I was kind of trying to take the blues back through what I learned in the grand mm -hmm. trying to uh, make my own brew, my own mix of the blues again, yeah. because I felt that the first time I played blues was, um, you know, the rip stripped album, then the commotion album uh, and, and everybody in the blues, not everybody, but you know, you had a lot of opinionated guys in the blues society uh, saying that this wasn't blues enough. And they were giving me the finger and they just wanted to dance. And I was like, this is not right. You know, the, the, the crowd was trying to take control over the stage. And that's why we started the grand in the first place, because we wanted to go our own way. Yeah. And, um, and everybody in the blues circuit was like, uh, where are you guys? Have you, have you, have you quit playing music? And we were on rock palace. And, but that's, that was how close that circuit was, you know? Um, so, yeah, well, um, all the songs I wrote in Oslo and, and a few more when we got, got here was like the basis of Electric. And the whole album was just like, fuck everything. Let's just have fun, you know? That's, it's a great record, man. There's no rules anymore, you know? <laughs> all the tra did you who Did you have a, somebody come in and engineer that and mix it, or did you take care of that yourself? My brother. He did a great job, man. Yeah, yeah he did a phenomenal job. And he played drums. So, so he's been engineering and playing drums on electric, dirt, uh, uh, vault, commotion. And he's been engineering the Lucky Lips album. And he's been engineering the new one coming up. Uh, now he's, he, he can do it all, you know. He's uh, quite a fabulous guy. <laughs> he can do it all. Question for you about that song, Stay A While. Um mm -hmm. Your voice, first of all, you got a great voice, and it's really funny because you sound, you almost sound like Southern in some of the stuff, you know, like you sound extremely American. There's no, if I just listened to your song and nobody, nothing would ever come to my mind and say, this guy's from another country or this certainly not from Norway. Um, but on, on that song in particular, Stay A While, your voice is like old school Motown soul. Mm-hmm. Which was which was really that I know you now is really interesting. Um, tell me about that song. Is, is there anything in particular about it? Stay a while. It's just such a great. I thought it was just such an awesome song. 
Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's actually a tribute to my hometown where I grew up, you know, and, and um, I think the opening line is something like there's no streetlights here because there, there didn't used to be streetlights. There was only headlights. Sure. <laughs> and um, I think that song is, is a tribute to uh, the, the intimacy of growing up in a small place uh, where the people you meet and the, you, you know everybody, yeah. you know. So there's there's this intimacy of not being too angry or too anything really because you're gonna face these people again probably next day right uh, so it's just this uh, do I know you I don't know you but I know you you know at the same time it's just mm. um, it's a different kind of vibe because everybody knows everybody could you live in a large town or a large city I tried. And it wasn't it wasn't your thing. I lived in Oslo for ten ten years, and I I loved it. But oh, you did. Once I um, once I got kids, and mm. then we tried to move back to Oslo because we we lived here for um, five years, close to the farm in this old uh, old house. And uh, since I was so much on the road, I kind of just left my wife there with the kids. In mm. the I didn't feel right. Yeah. We moved to Oslo. We lived there for uh, four months. And then we moved out back to the country again. Okay. We have some amazing neighbors now. We live closer to, you know, other houses. That's cool. But what I saw was that um, I saw it in my my kids' eyes. They were meeting other kids. And that kind of, um, um, this you know, that everybody was kind of, um, they everybody kind of agreed on that we are not going to, see each other ever again because it's such a big city it's not a big city worldwide but you know it's the big yeah yeah so it was that coldness it was that um you know everybody's a stranger kind of feeling sure and I, we wanted our kids to, to grow up closer to to people they would see the rest of the life if sure i get i totally get that especially if that's your your comfort zone and you know i could see wanting for your kids so the anim- anonymity of the, the being being um, a, you know a stranger. Yeah. What was that was what drew me to Oslo in the first place, and that was what drew me away from Oslo. Funny how that works, man. Yeah, that's interesting. You change at different points of time in your life. Different things become important to you. Yeah. As we were talking, I'm thinking, could I ever live in New York City again? I I probably could not permanently. Just no. you know, a few months here and there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the last track I wanted to talk about, which is something I mentioned a few times, is uh, Avenue Amgala from the Amgala Temple album. Again, that track just blew me away. What a great video. It was like psychedelic blues and jazz. Um, and it was almost like two songs. I felt like there was one, the opening was really bluesy, psychedelic. And then you sort of had a, like almost like a break. And yeah. then it and and then it was more jazzy, you know. And um, it's a nine minute song. Tell tell me about the making of that. Like, it's did the shortest you? We have. What's that? It's the shortest song we have. Is it really? It's a single. <laughs> I've, that was a, it's what a track. I've got to listen that. I didn't listen to that that album. I have to listen to it. Um, yeah. What? Tell me about that track. I mean, it's just so. Was most of that improv? Or or was like had you played it a few times? Yeah, ex- except for the except for the melody, uh, it's all improv. It was, and then uh, we we have, we have uh, the side on the arrangement, of course. And the second part is, I think it's in in uh, seven or in nine. Oh my god! Which was a big challenge for me because I only count to one. Well, I, I'm I'm glad you told me that because I'm not going to try to play with it. I'll just stick with the first half. Try to play along uh, with that. Uh, yeah you know and they have to teach me because you know uh, yeah as i said i only count to one <laughs> it's um, a- but you have in, in that band you have two geniuses and it's uh, guided on drums it's just- yeah that drummer was f- dude he was phenomenal yeah i mean off fantastic. fucking amazing yeah and you have Lars who plays uh, lap steel, pedal steel, bass, saxophone, flute, 
and keyboards and are also very schooled in how to write instrumental music. Okay. And that was also first for me because before Amwell Temple, I never played a melody on my guitar. You know, this was, that was foreign to me. And how could I find the sound to kind of make up, make that melody cool? Dude, that was, a, you did, a, that was the whole, and I'll tell you what was great about that, man. Um, well, I have some questions, but the, the effects that you use, yeah. they were perfect. I don't know. It was like some sort of a delay, but it was other stuff. What, what effects are on there? I think it's uh, the Supro Drive. Have you seen the, the blue one? No. Supro came out with this uh, pedal uh, collection. There was a drive, a fuss, and a tremolo, I think. But I bought the drive, the Supro Drive, so that's kind of on the whole time. That's, like, that's an overdrive. Yeah. But it's kind of to, to simulate that super old. Yeah. Drive. I have a super old here with 115. And, and when you crank it up, like I, the video I sent you, they, they sound kind of similar. The only thing is that the drive pedal, it's kind of it layers on top of the sound a bit too much for me. But that's on there. And um, I think the vibrato is like, um, uh, that's a Norwegian built pedal from this guy called uh, KB Effects. He made me a pedal with uh, Springer reverb, tremolo, and uh, vibrato, and phaser. Oh, my God. You got everything there. Yeah. <laughs> Little pedal. Before you stop making pedals, I, I think he's into painting now. Oh, wow. And then there's the, the um, uh, Moog. Moog. Um, they had, they had a MF drive. It's like a drive pedal with an expression pedal. So it works kind of like a filter. Okay. So I was, I think I was probably using the filter a lot. Uh, then the echo, I don't, I'm not sure about the echo. The fuzz was, what was, was the fuzz that the super fuzz drive or yeah, or it could be the fuzz mutant from, uh, from the basic audio. It was great, man. What? Well, cool <laughs> what? Check out basic audio. Fuzz mutant. What, what's the name of that company? Basic audio. Okay. What made you, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm on, what made you use your jazz master there? You dip. Is that popular yeah. there? Is dipping popular? Yeah. It's so funny. It's a habit. No, it's, uh, it was probably because of, uh, I bought that jazz master after I sold my SG. So, the jazz master was kind of the bridge for me between Gibson and Fender. Okay. Cause the jazz master is so different from a strap and everything. So, and also the vibrato on it is really, really cool. Yeah. It was very cool. You, you used it perfect. I mean, it, you leveraged that great in there, man. Yeah, yeah it was great. I, I was just so blown away by that track, man. And it also had that, that, you know, when you put it in between, it had this, that, that pointy hipster sound, you know, if you drench it in reverb and just, you can also do that with a Telecaster. The Strat doesn't have that to pick up, then you have to modify it. But um, so the Jazzmaster is a is a very very cool guitar. I've never played one. No, you have to try them. They're <laughs> just what I need. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> oh, this is this is a, a my new bridge guitar. <laughs> this is different. It's a bridge guitar. <laughs> And then you need an outro guitar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, great track. Great track, man. Anybody I w listening, I would love you to check out uh, Amgala Temple is the name of the uh, album. And this track is Avenue Amgala, A-M-G-A-L-A. Uh, in the beginning, mm -hmm. no, let me ask you this. You kind of like were a, a convert to the blues because you didn't necessarily play only, not that you play only blues now, but you weren't only, you, you were a, a rock pop more guy early on um people are often attracted to the blues because it's a great outlet for pain for emotional release like you said with your anger i was curious if there's anything in particular that you're healing through playing blues uh i don't know it's just been uh i've never been really at ease uh i'm just uh i'm kind of anxious and worried and um, i've been you know i've been i think i spent 40 years trying to find 
calm, you know? <laughs> yeah. And after a show. You're like 10 years away. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> it's right around the corner. I promise you. <laughs> and it's, but it's getting better, you know? And, um, and, and, um, but it's, it's just this, uh, this uh, eagerness and this, uh, all this energy and, and, um, playing blues and, you know, just playing guitar, being on stage, but it doesn't have to be on stage. I can play by myself for, for hours and hours and hours and just pretend that I'm on stage and mm. that helps, too, you know? Um, so I started playing, but I started playing blues when I was 10. That was like when I heard John Lee Hooker, mm. that was, that changed my life. And Buddy Guy, that was on Swedish television. They had a documentary and Buddy Guy was playing the first time I met the blues. You've probably seen it. And then they swiped the camera through the streets of Chicago. I haven't seen that one. I don't remember. But I've seen him in concert like three or four times. Yeah. Yeah. Great show. Different different guy every show. Different personality every show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah he's like, like you talked about, like three different characters. Yeah, he's like, you know, the buddy guy. Like, yo, motherfuckers, that kind of buddy guy. And then like, hey, man. I'm going to dig you. I'm going to, you know, the soulful, he was just like very animated, you know, and then there's the time I'm walking, walking through the crowd on a wireless mic. I know the first time I saw it was, uh, I think it was on this crossroads guitar festival. Hmm. Saw it on, and then he was playing sweet home Chicago. And then he said, yeah, you, you, you can sing along or you can't, or you don't, I don't give a fuck. You know, something like that. Was, yeah. What? That's him. That's him. About, to me, the, the, the sweetness of, he used the two first mics on the strap, you know? He, he's got such a great way of yeah. controlling volume and yeah. uh, in, in within a measure even of going from such intensity to such calm. And you know, it gives me goose, goosebumps just thinking about it. Yeah. When he does a uh, uh, long way from home, it's, uh, have you seen the Steve Ray Wong tribute show? Yeah. From Long, long time ago and when he just just like this you know and then just <laughs> and just he goes forever because he's got that you know that tbx tone control but that's just technical bullshit that doesn't matter it's, it's just the way he is using it and it's come how he's just being in, in charge you know the whole time i met him in 2003 did you get to play with him no i didn't he was just sitting outside in this Norwegian traditional knitwear that somebody gave him and he was drinking some bourbon or something. And I'm just, hello, you changed my life. Thank you so much. Oh, that's cool. See, that's nice. I was just in awe of this man. Then I saw him, I get to, I get to see him play a couple of years later and, and he had like this slow blues. He played slow blues for 20 minutes and I was just crying. It was just yeah. so emotional, you know? Yeah. He's, he's amazing. He's yeah. amazing. Uh, there's a live album of his um, that I always find is one of his best. Uh, I smell a rat. Maybe what is it called? Uh, yeah. Hang on. It's it's what it, is that from? It's a very old record. Let me look up Buddy Guy right here. It is. Oh, I didn't mean to put it on. It is uh, Buddy and the Juniors. Man, I'm sorry. It's called shit going through his records here it's this yeah. my oh it's called stone crazy oh yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's it's got only six tracks on it and i think it was recorded maybe in france it was in 1980 well it was released in 81 i don't know when the recording was my favorite album he's just uh, 10 he's just so awesome on every freaking track yeah stone crazy it's like a volcano you know? he really he really is he's, he's a he's a great artist man and he has inspired so many, you know, he, he inspired Jimi Hendrix, you know. Oh, yeah. Hendrix, Clapton, so many people. And there's footage of, you know, there's footage of Jimi Hendrix sit, sitting at, you know, the stage with Buddy Guy and recording his show. I've, I've seen that, yeah. Very cool. It all in perspective, you know. <laughs> you know the, uh, that, I'm sorry, was that? That made an impact. On you, the Buddy Guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big time. And that kind of uh, being that expressionistic, it's such a huge leap from what I'm growing up with. You know, that kind of... You mean culturally? Yeah, yeah. That kind of humble 
kind of thing you have at in farm communities. And here comes Buddy Guy, and he just he flew right out out of the TV, you know. <laughs> in is in Norway in general, or people tend to be more less emotional, more subdued, or not necessarily. I think uh, it's about the change through social media, and it's about the change. You know, people are getting more in touch with their emotions. Also, people aren't afraid of showing emotions anymore, like they maybe used to be. Sure, but in in the in the old kind of thing where, where I grew up, you know, you you not, you never see you never saw your father cry. You never saw a man sure. emotional or talk about feelings. Right. You know, my wife taught me to. She taught me how to speak about my feelings, you know. Oh, that's awesome, man. She took like this. She took the, like, I was a kid, you know, I, she took the second half of my upbringing. She, took, she raised me like the second half of it. No, that's, man, but I think that's great. Like, you know, that you learn some, I mean, my wife has been like that with me. So I mean, it's like, to me, I'm, I'm, what better situation than you can grow with a person and you know motivate each other to to be better to me that's i mean that's one of the pluses of any good relationship whether it's your your spouse your partner or just a, a you know a buddy even you know someone that pushes you to better i mean that's great you know yeah, we're lucky man and, yeah and, you know that she knows that if i'm if i'm miserable let's stop talking because that's the thing i do <laughs> <laughs> you're awfully quiet now Alman. are you okay and you're oh, no, actually, I'm not, you know, and then. Yeah. About it. That's cool, man. Yeah. You have to get to that point where you're okay talking about it because there's a vulnerability there. Yeah. And if you've never done that before, like I know I'm speaking for myself, it's not like something you could just jump into. You got to like baby steps. Yeah. And it's also kind of embarrassing to, to not, to not have the answers, you know, mm. to only have the questions and have the, the hurting. Yeah. Of it. But you don't have the questions because you're used to kind of explaining everything in words and kind of solving everything. But when it comes to feelings, there's not really answers. You know, you just have to talk about it. And when you hear yourself speak about it, maybe you can get a better grip of uh, what it is. Yeah. Matter with you. Yeah. Yeah. Or do podcasts. This is very therapeutic. <laughs> well, next question. Speaking of. What were some low points or dark periods that you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? I've been, you know, I've been struggling with uh, depression uh, and uh, anxiety and the feeling of not being, uh, you know, I've been, I've been so much on the road. I've been, I think I've been between 200 and 250 days on the road every year. For how long? 10 years. Then, yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. It's incredible, but it broke me in a I, big way. Yeah. I, I, that's not hard to believe, man. Holy crap. What, yeah. uh, so how have, to whatever extent you're comfortable, uh, yeah. what have you found to be helpful to you? Because a lot of people, I mean, the conversation I had yesterday with a really cool young woman, she was talking about the same thing. She suffers from depression. Um, and a lot of people do it's a, it's, and I'm so happy that people come on here and talk about it because there's a lot of people that are like, I think all of us, you sit in your house and you think the problems that you have, especially as it relates to mental things are like unique to you. And it's like, when you hear someone else, it's like, wow, that you, know, you feel less abnormal. You feel like, oh, you know, I can fix this. So what, what, how have you managed to, to like, what, what things have you put in place or are you putting in place or are you working on to sort of get through some of these issues? Well, I've, I've been starting to, to, uh, turn things down. Say Gigs. Things. Yeah. And projects. And, and you know, uh, I've been, um, I've been starting to say no to the stuff that I usually would say yes to because I love to play music, you know? Hmm. Uh, so I think I used to think about the playing part and the expressionistic part first, but then when the gig came or the project came, I was like, oh man, I have to go to the studio, get my gear. I have to go drive my car for eight hours to get there. Right. 
really want to take the girls to school tomorrow. So I'm going to go home in my car after the gig just so I can see oh. before I go to the next gig. So it's been, I, it's been stretching myself too thin, you know? Mm. So I, uh, I had a couple of sessions with a, with a shrink and she was really good. Oh, that's awesome. Is that common there? Like if, if you, if you haven't been to a therapist here in America, yeah, you're rare. more, yeah, you're more of like an, well, because it's like a, it's a, it, I mean, there's like, they're like Starbucks. There's one on every corner. Yeah. And now I, I, they have apps, you, you know, and, and it's, yeah, there's therapy apps. And I think like, um, zoom, you know, with zoom, everybody is going to, uh, you don't even have to leave your house now. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I think we're, I think we're as a, as a, you know, I think we're all dealing with mental health issues in a better way. And I think some of the shamefulness that used to be attached to it is trying, you know, it's slowly dissolving. Mm. And I think we, because, you know, we need to deal with mental issues the same way we deal with, you know, you, oh, you broke your, you broke your leg. Well, you know, let's go to rehab, man. Not like addiction rehab, but let's fix it. Fix. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, and, and, uh, and I think for every generation that comes along, I think uh, we're, or they are getting better at talking about, you know, talking about their feelings. Yeah. Because we need to do that. And there's always, you know, there's this pendulum, you know, there's, we can go too far and feel too much and talk about too much mm. and be more focused on the pro problem than being focused on how to fix it. Yeah. Solution. Correct. I agree with you. Also, yeah, of course, there's there's also like this, there's a kind of a business card, you know, yeah, I know what depression is, you know, here's, you know, there's a kind of this badge of, yeah, you're in the circle, you know. Yeah. But you know, it's a very, it's a very real thing, you know. It's also very different for everybody. Yeah. You know, the level of depression, what makes you depressed, how you get out of it, yeah. what caused it. Yeah, I know what caused it. That was just working too much. No, I wasn't asking you. Sorry, I, I was just saying what caused it. I was saying in general, like you know, what's different for everybody. Sorry, I, I was. That was, uh, yeah, was thinking out loud. Too. Yeah, no, that's good that you identified that, man. And it was probably hard to start turning down gigs in the beginning. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. You know, it was. But the, the last time I was burnt out was in in uh, twenty twenty in March actually, and after the Royal Albert Hall gig. Uh, and after that gig, I, I was, I was crying. I was throwing up. I was just exhausted. You know, I had, I had the um, responsibility of putting almost 40 musicians on stage. In yeah. The, the, as um, MD. <laughs> huh? As you were the music director there. Yeah. yeah. So my wife came, she wasn't really supposed to come, but she came, she knows me so well, you know, and she was like, I should be there for him. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. That was great. And uh, I'll never forget that, you know, because um, one of the one of the greatest guitar players from Norway ever is a guy called Knut Reijersrud, uh, and uh, he does it all. He he plays like Buddy Guy, he plays blues, he plays folk music. He does, you know, he's been on everywhere. A big hero to me. And uh, he was up on stage playing acoustic guitar and folk music in the Royal Albert Hall. I was sitting there just watching the sound check, you know, and she came, and I was like, okay. Yeah. Doesn't get any better than that. Go to work. Mm. You know? We pulled it off. Let's just, um, but you know, that was just uh, the, the last stop in this, in a string of being everywhere. I played in Nashville on a Thursday. I played in all in Norway on a Saturday. No way. Like that. And then roll Albert hall. Then the week after I played at the national theater, for a week with this play we made music for so it was on stage with my brother it was just too much yeah man and then and isn't it isn't it weird that the more you work the more you want to work <laughs> well <laughs> yeah memory. yeah also you just don't if you are driven it's like a in your mind it's like here's an opportunity don't squander it but you realize there's also an opportunity cost. So is it really an opportunity? 
And I'll be honest with you, I've learned from all of you guys and gals that I've interviewed only to do things that make me feel good because I see all the joy that playing music and I've turned down so much business stuff that I normally would have jumped on because it's, I'm not invested in it emotionally. And I'm like, why did I do that all? You know, I, I, there's no need to do stuff you don't, you can't get behind. You know, something else generally comes up to fill the void anyway. And even if it doesn't, you know, it will at some point. Yeah. You know, it's just the way. And you just feel so much better about it. And uh, yeah, and I've I've made that change. And I've I've told my kids about it. And uh, they grew up a different life. So they do tend to do things they like, you know, but uh, which is great. But I think that's what life's about. It is. You know, yeah, you're here to be happy. And I've been, but my problem has been that, you know, I, I loved every project I've ever been in. Yeah. Because it gave me that feeling for, for 90 minutes. I was like weightless. Yeah. Then so it's hard. Know, yeah. So it was hard for you to start. You tend to, you tend to forget about the cost, you know, you just focus on 19 minutes into 19 minutes into space. Yeah. But, uh, Yeah. It wears you it wears you out. It really does. Man, well I'm happy that you're open enough to go to a therapist and I'm happy that you're putting these changes in place, man. That's awesome. All, all this it's it's because my wife she she's been talking to me and supporting me in a big way and uh I've been talking a lot to Jace about this. We're really really open towards each other and uh I think it's I think it's about time we try to tear down all these illusions about how, how to be a man, how to be a, you know, it's, it's not a man thing. Everybody goes through this, but you know, if you're from a somewhere um, like this rural district here, you don't talk about depression. You don't talk about feelings. You don't talk about anything really. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think some of the problem, the resistance of that is stuff on social media. When you see other people, um, which I had a guest and I wish I knew who said it. Someone once told me, uh, social media doesn't show you all the film that's been cut and left on the floor, you know, but as a result, you see things and like, man, this person is always busy. And then you're like, so therefore I need to be busy, not knowing that this person is busy right now or what their deal is or who gives a shit really. You know, and like, you know, I never post, I only like tend to post stuff about my show on there. I never, like, I just assume no one gives a shit what I'm eating for dinner. Because yeah, well. <laughs> I certainly don't care what anybody else is eating for dinner. When I, when I see a post, I like, I want to send a bill to that person. Like you just fucking robbed about eight seconds out of my life to show me your tacos, man. That's, you know, you, you know. I want to send them a bill for that calculation, what that's worth, you know, it's like, God, but yeah, I know what you mean, but man, I'm glad you've done that. But, it, but another thing is that when you're trying to build a career and you're, you're afraid that you will be forgotten, you're also on this, uh, artistic journey. Yeah. <laughs> that that's, sounds nice. Huh? <laughs> no, but you know, it, 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 it's evolving, true. You're evolving and you're evolving through, uh, playing live and you're figuring stuff out and, and and it's all that and and then when you come home after a gig at four in the morning you scroll through the social media and i think that we kind of tend to um add up everything we see and we think it's one person yeah that's a good point we saw was yeah it's one person to you and you feel yeah. like oh ooh, there's still more more than needs to be done you know to keep this this pace up yeah i think that's a really good point i've never heard that but i bet you're i think you're correct i think because people are just seeing events, yeah. And as you're, as you're, you're not processing it as twenty people. You're processing it as all these events, and then you don't. You only have one over the next three weeks, so it's like, man, it's depressing. Yeah, yeah, that's and a good string, point. Like that's that's there. That's the outside. That's the world, and you're here. Yeah. And let's be honest, nothing's happening. So. Right. Right. <laughs> It's that gap between uh, activities and in this business, you need to be active and 
be on all the time. And I think that's probably one of the most positive things I got out of COVID is it taught me that I still exist as a human being. When I don't play five nights a week, I even exist more. As a right. Human being. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks a lot for sharing that. That was uh, very cool. I, I like what you said. I exist even more. I'm going to write that down. Write it down. Um, thanks, man. That was great. Uh, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. What Right now, what's your uh, go-to guitar? And what other two guitars round out your top three? I'm between uh, <laughs> I'm between go to guitar. <laughs> I am the I'm, 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 <laughs> guitars. Right now. <laughs> Sorry, let me show you the one we talked about. Yeah, because you know, uh, and again, my wife, she's like the she's she's the greatest ever. She she's been watching me uh, looking at black Stratocasters with maple necks, and I showed her one night, you know. Have you seen anything more beautiful? <laughs> Put in a bid for me, you know. This guitar was in Tokyo, and I've been to the store where I where I bought it, and it's a really cool guitar. But the neck is a kind of sticky, and uh, I'm just trying to kind of break it in. Uh -huh. But this guitar has it's a something. custom Strat, custom shop Strat fifty six. How are the 50s model, like how's a 56, for example, different from a 62? Because 62 seems to be the very common uh, reissue for Fenders. Yeah, yeah. But they, they started, I think they started doing the 57 and the 62 at the same time. Yes, 57, because they even have pickups, 57 slash 62. Yes, early, early 80s, I think. I think the, the one of the difference to me is the weight of them. I think always, uh, many times the 60s reissues are too heavy. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe it's a different type of wood or something. Yeah. Some of them feels really close down, you know, closed up. Uh, so, so the fifties ones are more open, and you have also have the the maple neck sounds different. And else, there's also the um, the shape of the neck is different because you got, you got the V shape instead of the C shape in the sixties. And so the V shape in the sixties is that thicker. Uh, the C shape in the sixties is uh, kind of slimmer. Okay, right. The C okay, so the fifties is the V neck. Then you're saying, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And that's a thicker neck. It's a thicker neck, and it's uh, it's it's more it's more of a struggle to play it, really. Yeah, but it's rewarding. It sounds like. There's just something true about that tone, you know, because you can hear the. The reason I bought it was I, I am, I'm into playing um, more finger finger style now. When when you play slide, are you open tuning? What are, or is it regular standard tuning? It's regular. Yeah. Because I feel like if you're tuning guitar to to uh, open tuning, you're kind of wasting a guitar. <laughs> no, I, I'm the same way. If I I don't play slide a lot, but I like standard tuning. It's like yeah. I'm still working with the setup, and it it doesn't handle the whammy bar anymore uh, for now. But I'll. Wow. It's a very cool guitar, you know. Wow, dude, your playing is so great, man. This is so nice to listen to it. So uh, I would I would take this on stage unless I was playing with the uh, Amgala Temple, then I would take uh, the red one because it's, it's just easier to play. Mm. Uh, this is a 60, it's a Fender 60 uh, reissue neck, which is kind of thicker. Oh yeah, you don't see it. It's, here. it's thicker? It's uh, thicker than some of the regular C-shaped necks, yeah. Oh, for so that particular neck, for some reason. For some reason. And I bought this guitar. And it had a Olympic white body, 
because I love that combination. Yeah. It's beautiful. Like your other guitar. Is that Olympic White? The uh, the first one you had? The, the one your dad gave you? They just, yeah. Oh. Um, I, I got it. You know, I was uh, pacing around the mailbox for uh, <laughs> weeks. You know, is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Yeah. Then finally it, it arrived. And then my wife, is in, she's in the kitchen and uh, I'm just opening this box up and I was like, oh, it's beautiful. And I pick it up and say, oh, fuck, it's too heavy. And That's you know, so disappointing, man. It's like 100 grams heavier than my regular, the gold strat that I've been using. That's just pieced together from parts. So what is 200 grams in ounces? Hang on. I'll t- uh, it's probably March, like a- 200 grams. Look how spoiled we are. 200 grams in ounces. Boom. Here's the answer. Seven ounces. That's a ha- almost a half a pound. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the car was just closed up. So this, this body, a dear friend of mine uh, painted the Colter Red in the 90s. It used to be, it's a Japanese reissue strat. Mm. And um, yeah. And it's just, uh, it's just easier to play, you know, for that umbrella stuff. What are you playing through? It's a 79 uh, Princeton. Hmm. Oh, it's a beautiful amp. There's a lot of knobs here. <laughs> yeah, it was a little too... Yeah. You know, did you you're you're self trained, self taught, one hundred percent, right? You do a really great job integrating like almost Delta stuff with modern, you know, yeah, like yeah. edge rock stuff. That's not very common. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jace Jace told me that uh, the first time he heard me play, it sounded it sounded backwards to him. I thought it was so cool. Oh, you mean like back in the, the the old? What do you mean by back? Like old? Like like you, there was something off about it in a cool way. Is yeah, that just different. That's a that's a huge compliment. Yeah, it's it's it it. You're. I hope. <laughs> what, yeah. Right. Hey, uh, Jace, I spoke with Craig. Um, no, what's different? Like, look, most blues. There's not massive differences between the players. And that's okay because you're there for the music, for the vibe. But you actually have a different thing that you bring to the table where you're at it. You do have this mix of old and new and it's very edgy. You know, it's, it's not, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that you're, you didn't use the word restless, but you're kind of restless. Yeah. If that's, if that's okay to use that word. And the, your music is like that. It's like you're waiting. It's like different parts of it are the calm before the storm. And when the storm comes, man, it's great, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and, cause you're doing something a little different. That's not like, ex- like expected. It's hard to play to play with because it's not technically it's harder than what you're doing. You know, it's not like shredding, but it's, w- which is great. But, uh, it's it's different, and that's why I have, your music appeals to me so much. That's so cool. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a mix between so many uh, so many things because you know that you have the what first got me into the blues was you know like I said, Johnny Hooker and the the way he just kind of he presses down on the strings. It sounds like like he's like buttoning his coat. <laughs> And then you have Buddy Guy, you know. Um... And then you have Robert Cray. And then you have Jimmy Wall. You know, and 
it's all in this in, it's all in this guitar and are you you're not playing with a pick or are you playing with a pick there i was playing with my hands now yeah that's what i thought that's so amazing man and then you have the the clap and then the crazy yeah. and then you have all my brothers Dude, that's so awesome. No, no, it's cool. It sounds great. Dickie Betts, you know, I love him. He's he he's another guy. He doesn't he what he did was totally unique. Yeah. You know, he didn't that way of playing Yeah, very unique style of playing, man. And no one's ever no one does Dickie like Dickie, you know. He's such a great player. Fantastic. Then I heard uh then I heard uh Derek Trucks. Amazing uh, player. Amazing. And then I heard uh Blake Mills and it, I was just my mind was blown. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you have to check out Guitar Moves with Matt Sweeney. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I know his show. I'll check yeah. it out. And Blake Mills is there, you know, demonstrating different ways. So that was what fascinated me. It was he has different ways of approaching the guitar. Uh, that was really inspiring to see. You know, he has that Indian kind of approach. <laughs> Yeah, Derek Derek Trucks has that as well. Yeah. And then you can double on the What are you you're not playing oct are you playing octaves there? Yeah. Yeah, it sounded great, man. Holy yeah. shit. That in the bottom. And also what I've been experimenting lately is trying to make um the slide guitar sound more like a sitar. Oh, sorry. Like a sitar. Yeah. That's and cool, man. Knut, like I mentioned, the greatest Norwegian guitar player, he taught me how if you mute the strings with your palm, you can get this. Oh, that's really like a sitar. That's just with palm muting? You're not doing anything with the volume? Just a palm. Wow. Mm -hmm. For my final trick. <laughs> <laughs> I just figured this out a couple of months ago. If you do like this, you put a scarf on it. Yeah. It sounds like banjo. That's hilarious, man. I've never seen that. Never ever seen that. Are you palm muting at the same time? No. No. Finger picking, Finger picking with the. It sounds so because the notes are so abbreviated, so staccato. Yeah, it's just a scarf. That's wild. Hey, scarf guitar. Yeah. There you go. So, so basically, you're a Strat guy primarily. I am now. today when i was a kid and yeah. uh now i'm back and uh, i finally that was my goal to figure out a way to make the strat sound like me yeah uh, it was so full of uh, uh it was so full of names that guitar was so full of names you know we have a you know five legends per position here yeah <laughs> yeah that's very <laughs> true it's it's it is so, try, so trying to get away from that was like uh uh, something I'm really, really proud of. I'm still working on it, but you know, I'm I'm really proud of that because I just love the concept of the, the strats. Yeah, well, it sounds great in your hands. So please keep working at it. What's the last thing you listened to? It was probably uh, uh, "Turn Around" by Los Lobos from the This Time album. Because I was trying to find find some some mixing references for the Lucky Lips album. Gotcha. Yeah. Give me your uh, top three Desert Island discs. Uh, Live at Leeds. Right. Uh, we'll buy the Who. And uh, I have to have um, Band of Gypsies. You know. Who? 
Band of Gypsies. Oh, Band of Gypsies. Okay. And then I'm going to throw in uh, Greatest Hits with uh, Dwight Yoakam. That's interesting. I love I love Dwight Yoakam. I've been a, you know I've been a country fan almost as long as I've been a blues fan, and it was the guitar playing that took me. Pete Anderson. Yeah, yeah. I had Pete on the show. He's an awesome guy. Ah, I got to hear that. He's a really nice person. Yeah, yeah. It, it was really funny because I remember the first like I think maybe the first or second question I I asked him. You know, he goes. Craig, I have to tell you, I told my wife I'm done with these fucking interviews. He goes, but you asked me two questions. No one's ever asked me before. I'm so excited. Let's keep going. <laughs> and I was like, because, you know, I, he's like a legend, man. So I was like, you know, I just want to honor and respect. You know, I wasn't nervous per se. I just wanted to make sure he felt respected for the work I've done. To You know, so I was like, OK, good start. <laughs> testament to your show oh uh, thanks you do that you you send these questions and you're like i don't i'm not even sure if i know myself well like, <laughs> uh, in a manner you know it's just, yeah it's really delightful and uh, thanks you're not you're not just talking to the guitar player you're talking to the the person and i think that's kind of rare you know many podcasts can go on and on about how long are your cables and which what kind of strings and but the truth is you know, beneath that, you know, why do you play the way you play? Yeah. Well, I, I like to learn stuff, you know, and, and, and it's a better connection. The connection I have with, like I said, when I bump into somebody after they're on my show, even if it's a year or two later, it's like, as you give each other a hug is like, uh, there was a, con we established a connection, you know, that I, I can't do talking about strings, No, you know? And so it's, it's a nice, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. There are 11s, by the way. <laughs> Duly noted. 